Okay, so for the symposium clinical interpretation of abdominal pain, I prepared this lecture and hopefully I can teach you a little bit about the pathophysiology of um, extra abdominal and non surgical causes of abdominal pain. Because not all abdominal pain and vomiting is something you're going to end up referring to a general surgeon. Okay, so this is probably the most important slide of the lecture. Um, if you can at least just learn this slide, you'll become a better doctor for the rest of your career, even if you ignore all the subsequent slides. And I'm basing uh, this slide based on uh, my own clinical experience and by observing doctors, um, especially your young doctors. Um, I've encountered interns and community service doctors, and um, I've also encountered doctors freshly coming out of community service. And the fact of the matter is that in state you often have very little supervision and you pick up uh, bad habits of other doctors because uh, ma ma many of the things that were done in state is not, uh, many of the ways that we do things in state is not the way sh medicine should be actually be practiced. Um, so you pick up bad habits and there's no one there to correct your bad habits or to teach you the right way of doing things and you often we see these young doctors going into private practice after finishing community service and they've still got these bad habits and they're making really stupid, retarded mistakes. Um, and unfortunately, um, you cannot, you don't really have any good excuses um, for making these uh, mistakes. Uh, as a doctor, it's up to you to make sure that you can practice good medicine and not up to your supervisors or your community service hospital or due to or to your internship, it's up to you. And one of the things that really, especially University of Pretoria students miss is uh, the ectopic pregnancy. When I was an intern at Calafong, we had a few patients referred to us as an appendicitis when in fact it was an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, even when I worked in private emergency units, um, there was a patient at the emergency unit next door and even at my own emergency unit where the doctors Luckily it wasn't me, but uh, there were doctors who sent uh, patients home with ectopic pregnancies. And this is a life-threatening condition. Um, and I think possibly as U University of Pretoria students, the reason that we're missing these is because um, Block 8 doesn't have any gynecolo gynecology in it. So when you think of abdominal pain, we tend to think back to Block 8 rather than to gynecology. And then we make these stupid mistakes of missing ectopic pregnancies and referring ectopic pregnancies to surgeons. And I promise you, if you refer an ectopic pregnancy to a surgeon uh, in private practice, your reputation is going to suffer a huge knock. And if you're working in an emergency unit, you're probably going to be in a little bit of trouble because that's quite incompetent. That said, um, in state, it's quite common for casualty officers to refer ectopic pregnancies to general surgeons, but that's just generally due to the poor levels of oversight uh, in the state service. A diabetic crisis uh, can also cause abdominal pain. Um, sometimes the first si warning sign of diabetic ketoacidosis um, is abdominal pain, and that's a life-threatening condition. Um, I have heard of one patient that was sent home with gastroenteritis when in fact it was early DKA, and that can uh, be quite... S uh, DKA is a serious life-threatening condition, so uh, it's quite a stupid mistake to send someone home as a gastroenteritis when they in fact uh, going into DKA. And in this day and age with uh, medical aids paying for less and less, um, a lot of patients are skipping their health checkups and there are, uh, are more patients that are obese with unhealthy lifestyles and there's a lot of undiagnosed diabetes out there um, that might present to your emergency unit or to your GP practice as um, abdominal pain um, uh, as a first sort of warning sign as, as they're about to go into DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. But I'll discuss um, uh, just now on the later slide exactly how that acidosis causes the pain. Myocardial infarction or heart attack often um, will cause epigastric pain and can sometimes even cause burning epigastric pain. So your patients will be complaining, oh, I've got such bad heartburn, when in fact they're having a heart attack. So. Um, there was in fact a case at a hospital where I worked where a patient was admitted with a suspected peptic ulcer when in fact he was actually having a massive heart attack and it was diagnosed, the heart attack was only diagnosed about five minutes before the patient died and there was a whole 
uh, mess regarding that case. And uh, renal stones can also cause quite severe um, abdominal pain. Um, so do keep that in the back of, of your mind. Another thing I've noticed, University of Pretoria students miss is pancreatitis, which is important in our HIV patients. An HIV patient with mild abdominal pain might actually be having pancreatitis, and if you send them home as a gastroenteritis, you might, might get worse and worse and you might die. Alcoholics can get pancreatitis, but pancreatitis can happen to everyone. And um, in general, if you're going to do blood tests on a patient with severe abdominal pain, always do your pancreatic enzymes, your amylase, your lipase. Um, that's it. In the state sector, the most common cause of abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting um, in, s in your hospitals by townships uh, is probably going to be pneumonia. When I was working at Kalafong Hospital, pretty much the number one cause of vomiting and abdominal pain was pneumonia and number two was TB. So the vast majority of cases of abdominal pain uh, in Kalafong Hospital ended up going to the physicians to treat for the pneumonia. Um, so um, don't be lazy uh, when you see a patient with abdominal pain. Examine all the systems because um, I promise you you're not going to make friends with the general surgeons if you're going to refer them uh, pulmonary effusions uh, and pneumonias. Um, whenever there's a little bit of abdominal pain and vomiting. In our HIV patients and ARVs, um, we need to consider lactic acidosis. All abdominal pain in an ARV patient is lactic acidosis until proven uh, otherwise. So, now that I've told you these things, how are you going, how can you, uh, how can I teach you to make sure that you don't miss uh, these diagnoses and you don't make stupid stupid mistakes that's going to get you in court or uh, end up, uh, making you kill your patients. Well, what you need are have, or need to have a good bedside examination habits. Um, you need, um, a lot of these things can be excluded at the bedside. You don't necessarily need expensive tests. Uh, and remember, more and more patients cannot afford to have expensive tests because the medical aids are paying less and often patients, especially in December, will come to your emergency unit and they are broke and they can't afford much. Well, we don't have to do uh, expensive tests. Urine pregnancy tests is about um, 40 bucks or 20 bucks if you're using the cheapest one. And uh, that's gonna, that's a pretty good screening tool um, for our ectopic pregnancy. In very early ectopic pregnancies, the urine pregnancy test can still be um, negative, but if a patient has mild abdominal pain and the urine pregnancy test is negative, um, chances are you can safely send the patient home. Um, if you do want to do blood tests on that patient, always do a blood pregnancy test, uh, a quantitative beta HCG test. Uh, to make 100% sure the patient really is not pregnant. But if you're a GP and the patient just has a mild abdominal pain and the urine pregnancy test is negative, um, you probably uh, don't have to worry much. Even if it is an ectopic pregnancy, it's going to get worse. The patient will come back to you and by then the pregnancy test will be um, positive. It's unlikely that a pregnancy, ectopic pregnancy is going to rupture so early in the pregnancy while the pregnancy test is still negative. Urine dipstick is going to show blood if there's a renal stone, and then you can order, if you're working in an emergency unit, and there's severe colicky pain, and there's lots of blood in the urine, you can um, call the urologist and ask, can you know, do a spiral CT scan to check for renal stones, because um, you're suspecting renal stones, because renal stones most often, uh, more often than not, will cause um, blood in the urine. And of course, uh, you can also pick up infections uh, of the kidney or the bladder as well, which can also cause severe abdominal pain. Finger prick glucose, very quick way of checking your blood sugar. Um, you really have no excuse for missing a DKA when it's so easy to check the blood, the blood sugar. And that's about uh, 20 rand. The dipstick is about 20 rand. Pregnancy is about 20 rand. So it's we're up to 60 rands now of uh, special investigations for our patient that uh, is on a budget. Um, you should consider doing ECGs as part of your vital signs, especially if you're working in an emergency unit. Um, probably not as relevant if you're a GP, because um, I mean that's um, ECG um, is about 100 rand for all the stickers and about 100 rand for the interpretation. 
uh, as a GP you can always do um, always give a discount uh, but if you're working in an emergency unit uh, often that's going to be out of your hands so that's extra 200 rands the patient often has to pay um, furthermore it's extra time that's taken if you're a GP it's going to take you about 10 minutes to do a decent ECG uh, but if you're an emergency unit you have a sister who's doing the ECGs the patient has funds you probably should do an ECG as part of your routine vital signs such as blood pressure and pulse um, with any abdominal pain um, because you're such a higher chance of getting a patient with a heart attack because uh, some of these patients have abdominal pain when they're actually having a heart attack but so severe they'd rather go to the emergency unit that's already a risk factor uh, for having a possible heart attack that's causing abdominal pain Okay, never trust your sisters in state or in private um, do your own blood pressures do your own pulse rates and especially do your own respiratory rates because your average nurse in state or in private has absolutely no idea how to do respiratory rate and I promise you when you're working at Colophon Hospital all the respiratory rates will be 20 they will be counted as 20 even when the respiratory rates are 44 or even when the respiratory rates are 10 the nurses will always say the respiratory rate is 20 so please do your own respiratory rates and obviously if there's a very fast respiratory rate you need to think okay is there something wrong with the lungs that kind of, that's often your first warning sign that is actually a pneumonia uh, causing this patient's problem um, and it can also be a warning sign of uh, acidosis as well so that's going to help you a bit with your diagnosis and really this is going to cost the patient absolutely nothing uh, it's uh, part of your it should be part of your uh, a good history ask for the last normal menstrual period uh, in our female patients if they've missed a period think topic if they're in the mid cycle think um, mid cycle pain if they're just on their period think dysmenorrhea uh, this is quite helpful and uh, for some reason um, University of Pretoria students are not comfortable with asking about the last normal menstrual period and um, the, the young doctors coming out of UP tend to skip this question and they make really buggered up mistakes because of that. But please learn to ask this question. If you're ordering blood tests, as I mentioned, do a quantitative beta HCG to take pregnancy, amylase and lipase to check um, for pancreatitis and a blood cast to check your blood pH on top of all the other usual investigations that you will do for your abdominal pain and I think if uh, I hope you absorb the lessons in the slide this is gonna really help you avoid serious medical legal pitfalls and it's gonna make you a better doctor um, in the next few slides we're gonna go a bit more detail on the pathophysiology uh, of certain conditions that can cause abdominal pain uh, but not necessarily need to be treated by a general surgeon Okay, so acidosis due to kidney failure such as uremia or due to diabetes such as diabetic ketoacidosis or lactic acidosis can cause abdominal pain. It's well known to cause abdominal pain. Sometimes abdominal pain can be so severe um, you actually th you think you have a surgical abdomen when it's actually the acidosis and um, exactly why that happens we're still not clear on. Uh, but it's thought to be due to the um, um, pH effects on, on uh, the stomach causing gastritis um, and there's vascular flow changes we know the blood vessels are sensitive to pH changes so we think there's some flow changes in the GIT possibly causing some ischemic pain um, and then acidosis also causes nerve dysfunction along the gut wall causing distension uh, of the gut wall and pain and ileus so the gut wall doesn't move the contents and the contents builds up and that causes pain Unfortunately, sometimes an appendicitis or some other abdominal pathology can actually trigger off an acid crisis. So you might have an appendicitis in a diabetic patient that causes high blood sugar, which causes acidosis, which worsens the abdominal pain. And sometimes you're not quite sure um, uh, what exactly um, came first. Um, was, is it acidosis causing the pain or is it abdominal pathology causing acidosis causing uh, abdominal pain? Uh, for example, so um, that is something to think about um, but um, you put that in your differential diagnosis, you check the blood sugar, you check the um, pH levels on the blood gas and you include that on your p uh, differential when you're discussing the case of the surgeon. If your adrenal glands aren't working, you're going to have a uh, loss of cortisol um, and that's going to cause that lack of cortisol 
cortisol is going to cause dysmotility in your stomach, um, uh, which can cause pain uh, due to gastritis because the acids are being flushed out. And these patients also develop uh, inflammation of the abdominal organ linings or serocytis. If you have thyrotoxicosis or pheochromocytoma, and there's too much thyroid hormone or too much catecholamines, um, you can also develop abdominal pain. Sometimes that would be the main symptom the patient presents with. Uh, possibly this is due to hypermotility, due to the stomach being overstimulated by these hormones. Um, as they're being overstimulated, they start stretching too much, that can cause pain. And um, the excess catecholamines um, and the sensitivity um, to catecholamines due to thyroid hormone um, can cause the blood vessels to contract um, at the gut wall that can cause ischemia. But in the same way that uh, these conditions can cause abdominal pain or that abdominal pathology can cause these conditions, um, abdominal pathology can trigger off um, a thyroid storm. So again, it's something you need to um, be on the lookout for. Is it the hormonal condition causing the abdominal pain or the abdominal pathology causing the hormonal condition? Okay, um, I'm going to be referencing a lot uh, regarding the vagus nerve. This cranial nerve, cranial nerve 10, is a mixed function nerve. It's got supplies to the throat, the lungs, the heart, the liver, the stomach, spleen, kidney, intestines. And if there's a problem at any of these aforementioned organs, the vagus nerve is going to activate, and it can disturb the function of any other organ. And more often than not, it affects stomach and intestines. Um, and that's just one of the consequences of having a multitasking nerve, that um, where it's working at one spot, it then has unintended consequences at another spot. However, the vagus nerve is also now thought to um, exert anti-inflammatory effects. So possibly the reason the entire vagus nerve gets stimulated when only one organ is stimulated is because it's trying to uh, flood the body with um, uh, anti-inflammatory molecules. Anyway, um, back to the pathophysiology of these conditions. Uh, with cardiac conditions such as a heart attack or pericarditis or, or pericardial effusion, um, that pain can either be referred into the abdomen due to the way that the sensory nerves uh, in that area are wired. There's some common pathways from the abdomen and from the heart, so sometimes there's common pathways get irritated and get confused as to where the pain is coming from. Or uh, due to the um, inflammation around the heart, uh, or stimulation of the vagus nerve, the stimulation of the vagus nerve, which then causes an upset in the stomach and the intestines uh, with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. Congestive cardiac failure in and of itself, um, as uh, blood is unable to circulate, out of the abdomen, um, fluid collects in the abdomen, there's distension of abdominal organs and then there's ileus uh, due to um, distension of the gastrointestinal walls which can cause a build up of contents which can cause pain. Respiratory conditions such as a pulmonary embolus or pneumonia or pleural effusion or TB um, can cause pain um, in the abdomen and often also nausea and vomiting. Same similar mechanisms of cardiac condition is either referred pain or it's due to s activation of the vagus nerve. Okay, porphyria is known to cause abdominal pain. Um, hemolysis can cause abdominal pain, and that's due to the breakdown products of hemoglobin and the fact that there's too many hemoglobin precursors around. And it's funny, funnily enough, although we rely on hemoglobin to deliver oxygen and nutrients and we can't live without it, um, the waste products and the build-up products for hemoglobin are all toxic to us. And as we build up these toxic waste products or toxic precursor products, um, they uh, attack the intestinal nerve supply and porphyria is known, uh, especially is known to cause uh, colicky abdominal pain due to this uh, neuropathy. Uh, hypercalcemia is known cause of abdominal pain, of sort of moans, groans, uh, and stones. So the groans part is from the pain. 
so hypercalcemia is often due to hyperparathyroidism, can be due to malignancy, and what happens is that this high calcium level disturbs our gastrointestinal pacemakers, which messes up our peristalsis, causes ileus and distension, and that causes pain. Also, calcium is needed to regulate uh, gastric and pancreatic secretions, so there's dysregulation of these secretions, and then you might end up with gastritis or pancreatitis. Lots of calcium can also um, end up in the kidneys, where they can cause calcium stones. Um, excess calcium um, can also end up in the gallbladder, which, which can also predispose to gallbladder stones. Any infection, especially in the elderly and in children, can cause abdominal pain and vomiting and nausea. Typical examples, throat infection, ear infection, blood infection, really anything, any infection can cause it. Uh, part of it's due to the release of inflammatory cytokines and uh, from the source of infection uh, that can either irritate the GIT organs directly or they can stimulate the vomiting center of the brain. Uh, and then part of it's due to vagal vagus nerve sensitivity it becomes overactive um, and can cause nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain. So quite often when uh, if you're a GP and um, little five-year-olds and four-year-olds come to you and even three-year-olds and younger and the parents complain well the child's vomiting and vomiting and vomiting quite often you'll look in the throat and you'll see a tonsillitis or, pharyn or separator pharyngitis and you can say the diagnosis is due to that uh, the, the illness is due to that with because of the and then that squashy causing the vomiting is a secondary thing. Also with infections you might have swelling of your abdominal lymph nodes, so called mesenteric adenitis, which can be a painful condition in and of itself, and that can be present in tick bite fever, HIV and infectious mononucleosis. And bear in mind that septicemia uh, and malaria especially can cause hemolysis and that hemolysis, as I've mentioned in the previous slide, um, can cause abdominal pain. In addition, encephalitis and meningitis are often uh, accompanied by nausea and vomiting. Um, in addition to the effects of infection that I've discussed here, they can also raise your intracranial pressure, uh, which stimulates your vomiting center, and as the uh, abdominal contents contract in order to cause vomiting, that can cause pain and uh, that explains that mechanism. Unfortunately, vomiting in and of itself causes your intracranial pressure to rise, uh, which can, can cause uh, even more of activity of the vomiting center, so it's a vicious cycle. And obviously a direct infection of the, um, of the gastrointer uh, um, gastrointestinal tract um, can cause abdominal pain. Uh, with direct irritation of the abdominal wall and you get spasms, uh, increased bowel movements, uh, increased secretions which will cause diarrhea. And as a note, um, tetanus is relatively rare these days but that can cause tetany uh, of all your abdominal musculature along the GIT um, causing abdominal pain. Okay, uh, ovarian torsion and ectopic pregnancy are quite commonly misdiagnosed as appendicitis, especially by uh, UP students who tend to think um, of gynecology and, and uh, abdominal pain as being separate things. Um, so it's easy to miss this uh, di diagnosis. Uh, please, as a routine thing for abdominal pain in, pre uh, in women, always check for pregnancy. and. Um, Often in private, the general surgeons, when you recall them and say it's an appendicitis, they say, did you do a sonar? Um, because um, quite often ovarian torsion can be picked up on sonar, pelvic inflammatory disease can be picked up on sonar, and then they'll tell you, um, do the sonar and you know, make sure it's uh, not a gynecological problem, because they'd rather not be dealing with ovarian torsions. If you don't have access to a sonar, you can do a vaginal examination. Uh, ovarian torsion causes swelling of the ovary, ectopic pregnancies causes uh, adnexal mass sometimes and that you can maybe pick up of a vaginal exam. If you have a particularly rich patient and you're in a real resource center, uh, you can even consider doing a CT of the abdomen to make the final diagnosis. And uh, women uh, who are having a period can have quite severe abdominal pain. Uh, at the time of ovulation, uh, you can also have mid-cycle pain, 
that can sometimes be surprisingly severe, uh, but can be managed with pain medication and not uh, doesn't necessarily need you to cut the patient open um, in theatre. Testicular torsion usually cause uh, quite severe scrotal pain, so it's not often as confused for acute abdomen, but the pain can refer into the abdomen. Sickle cell disease is known to present with uh, abdominal pain during acute uh, crisis. Um, basically, similar mechanism of, a, of hemolysis because the sickled erythrocytes break down, releasing heme products. Um, but also, the sickle cells themselves um, can block your blood vasculature, which can cause ischemic pain or infarction pain due to the lack of oxygen uh, in any abdominal organ. And the excess bilirubin. Uh, can also cause renal or gallbladder stones. I should have actually mentioned that along with the hemolysis hemoly section. Um, and yeah, pain can be so severe in sickle cell disease that you might need to do a CT scan uh, to decide whether you really may need to cut open this abdomen or not. Um, the CT scan is normal. Just give pain medication and let the sickle cell crisis burn itself out. Neutropenia, in other words, a lack of our neutrophils. It's a type of immunosuppression um, that you'll find in your cancer patients and chemotherapy, in your HIV patients, or any condition that predisposes to immunosuppression. And when you don't have these neutrophils, bacteria and fungi uh, will start invading the defenseless gut wall. Uh, that can cause ulcers, it can even cause necrotizing enterocolitis or gangrene of the intestines. Um, that bacterial overgrowth can cause diarrhea and distension, um, and that uh, can cause abdominal pain. And so, um, because of this invasion of the abdominal wall, this inflammation and the bowel walls can become thickened, and sometimes you can make the diagnosis on CT or sonar by just seeing that the, uh, that the uh, bowel walls are these thick bowel walls um, in a patient with. Um, that you know has HIV or in a patient that you know has recently had chemotherapy and you might be able to avoid um, cutting them open. Okay, so there's a genetic disorder called familial mediterranean fever uh, which occurs with uh, ethnic groups that traditionally uh, lived around the Mediterranean such as Jews, Lebanese pa patients, Egyptians, um, Greeks, etc, etc and uh, they get recurring episodes of fever and inflammation of the lining of the abdominal organs and it can be so bad you might think it's an acute abdomen um, but you don't have to cut these people open because this pain will resolve usually in 12 to 96 hours just with pain medications and anti-inflammatories. If you have too many eosinophils, the eosinophils can sometimes invade the gastric wall um, and our eosinophils are involved in our allergic reactions and we can treat a cynophobic gastroenteritis the same as an allergic reaction and often there'll be a family history or personal history of allergies um, uh, that might uh, point to why this patient's having this condition. Polyarteritis nodosa is a systematic uh, vasculitis if you're involved, uh, if we're inflaming our blood vessels we might have ischemia and infarcts um, it might be bleeding and perforation of the GIT organs and um, it's a systemic inflammatory disorder so it might be inflammation of any abdominal organ causing that abdominal organ to swell up and um, give off pain. In offshore line purpura, I'm sure the pediatricians will mention to you but that's an IgA mediated vasculitis <coughs> which can cause inflammation of almost any organ um, which can uh, thus abdominal pain systemic lupus erythematosus and open immune disorder which can cause vasculitis or inflammation of any abdominal organ. Um, I've gone into both these uh, possibilities in the previous slides, I'm not going to discuss that in detail again. Um, food allergies can cause loss of histamine release into the gut wall with uh, inflammation that can be accompanied by systemic allergy or anaphylaxis, so you might have a patient with abdominal pain and an uh, itchy rash that happened after they eat, ate um, some fish, for example. And that's treated, uh, and that the abdominal pain will often resolve as you treat the allergy. Okay, so tuberculosis can spread to any abdominal organ, and once that organ is filled, 
with the TB bacillus. Uh, I'm gonna get that uh, caseous necrosis and inflammation that's gonna cause pain. Um, so any abdominal organ can be affected by TB, cause abdominal pain. And usually there will also be weight loss and night sweats along with that sort of pointing in the right direction in terms of the diagnosis. In pediatrics, um, for some reason any infection in a child will cause vomiting and will cause abdominal pain. They, if the child gets a sore throat, he will vomit and complain of abdominal pain. If there's an ear infection, it will vomit and complain of abdominal pain. If there's a cellulitis of the little toe, he's going to vomit and complain of abdominal pain. So I don't know why, just it's just the way God wired kids. At the moment something goes wrong, they start puking. In an evolutionary sense, maybe it's just a way of warning parents and people around them that this child is sick. After all, most children have great difficulty exactly describing their symptoms, um, and uh, conversely, they have great ease in vomiting whenever they're sick. So maybe vomiting is just a child's way of saying, I am sick. The worrying thing, though, is that um, often the only sign of uh, meningitis in a child will be abdominal pain and vomiting. Um, so then how do you decide, gosh, um, is this vomiting due to something minor or is it due to something serious like meningitis? Well, you have to do a thorough physical examination, find a possible source for the infection. Um, if the fontanelles uh, are still open, you have to feel the fontanelles for bulging. And um, also always keep the back door open. Um, tell the patients, um, parents, um, listen, you need to call me if the child's not getting better. Um, or you need to uh, go to an emergency unit. So always keep that back door open. So it does just diagnose a bit of a gastro. Um, just remember to tell the parents, you know, don't if the child's getting worse, please seek further medical attention. Okay, if you're unlucky enough to ingest heavy metals, um, that's going to cause um, corrosion of your GIT wall, bloody diarrhea. As you heal, you're going to have inflammation and sc inflammation and scarring. Worst case scenario, you're going to have hepatic inflammation and hepatic failure, and this can all cause abdominal pain. The black widow spider, um, the toxin of that spider releases um, uh, the neurotransmitters at the synaptic junctions of your muscles, and so you're going to have um, overstimulated muscles, you're going to have hyperactivity of the GIT, you're going to have maybe some diarrhea, some intense cramping pains before you eventually have. Um, full body convulsions and uh, eventually die unless you get um, spider antivenom. Okay, so with your opiates, and also this includes your opioid drugs like morphine and codeine, um, when people first start abusing cocaine or when you first start giving a patient morphine, um, they're going to have slowed intestinal motility, they're going to have ileus. Uh, with that ileus, they're going to have a bit of distension and abdominal discomfort and pain. Over time, that effect um, fades away uh, as your body gets used to the opiates and opioids. But then, once you're sort of addicted to the opiate or opioid, if you have to withdraw it, um, then you're going to have relative intestinal overactivity uh, with abdominal spasms and diarrhea um, due to the withdrawal of the opiates. So sometimes um, drug addicts are trying to go cold turkey or trying to do a sort of a self-help uh, rehab program at home. Uh, will sometimes present with abdominal pain uh, once the withdrawal syndrome starts kicking in. Extremely rare variant of epilepsy um, can cause seizures of your GIT muscles. Um, I've never seen this myself and it's unlikely anyone will ever see it, so I'll any of you guys will ever see it, so I suggest putting this on the very bottom of your uh, differential diagnosis. Um, but yeah, if a patient has a sort of um, epilepsy-like syndrome with absence attacks accompanied with um, any sort of weird symptoms such as abdominal pain or uh, pain in the ear or whatever, you know, you can start thinking in that direction. And glaucoma. Eye pain, in other words, or increased eye pressure activates your ocular abdominal reflex, which is mediated by the trigeminal nerve, which causes stimulation of the vagus nerve and causes severe intestinal and gastric cramping and vomiting. And strangely enough, sometimes uh, these patients will be more concerned about the pain in the abdomen than in the pain in their eye. 
uh, but note any eye pathology can cause abdominal pain and vomiting because of this ocular abdominal reflex, so conjunctivitis, um, or a stab wound to the eye, etc., etc., uh, can cause quite significant abdominal symptoms. But the one that has the best association of activation of this reflex is glaucoma. Um, I hardly ever seen a conjunctivitis that causes abdominal pain and vomiting. Maybe a little bit of nausea, but no. Conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis will usually not cause that uh, such uh, such severity in symptoms. Okay, with your cancers or your leukemia, lymphoma, you can have inflammation of any abdominal organ, and with these in particular, you can have enlarged abdominal lymph nodes, mesenteric adenitis, so-called, um, and that can cause quite significant abdominal pain. <coughs> Angioedema is when you have swelling uh, due to vascular leakage. It's uh, usually an autoimmune response. With angioedema, um, your GIT walls can swell up, uh, which will cause distension of ileus, and that will be a mechanism of abdominal pain and angioedema. Although, to be honest, uh, the most common presentation of angioedema is swelling of the tongue and face rather than the GIT wall. And of course, renal stones um, or even a, a renal infection, pronounced pyelonephritis, can cause abdominal pain um, and can cause quite severe abdominal pain. Um, but uh, you're going to get. Um, some general surgeons very ticked off if you refer them renal stones. Um, so, I mean, take a good history, do a good examination. If it's more flank pain and renal angle pain and there's blood in the urine, um, uh, order a spiral CT scan to exclude stones before, you, before the patient ends up getting cut up open as a potential acute abdomen. Remember, general surgeons sometimes are so stuck for so long uh, in the speciality that they completely forget their urology and their gynecology. Um, and a lot of these guys cut first and ask questions later. So it's up to you as a casualty officer or as a GP to, um, to uh, make sure your patient doesn't end up uh, um, under the knife unnecessarily. Okay, any problem with the spine can um, refer into the abdomen and the patient might be complaining of abdominal pain and also vice versa. I remember one case I had in Kalafong Hospital when I was an intern in orthopedics uh, of a patient with scoliosis and very, very, very severe back pain. And we couldn't figure out what was causing the back pain, so we gave him some brufins and some physio. My next rotation after that was general surgery, and lo and behold, that patient came back uh, vomiting blood, and I had to admit the patient as an intern for surgery, we had a gastroscopy, had a gastric ulcer, we treated him for the gastric ulcer, took him away from the brufin, which, will, which actually made the gastric ulcer worse, and the gastric ulcer resolved and the back pain completely resolved as well. Um, so that was one of those trick cases where the patient's primary complaint didn't properly localize the site of pathology. Abdominal muscle spasm can cause quite a painful abdomen and also a rigid abdominal wall that can be mistaken for uh, guarding but there will usually be a clue on the history. The patient will say, yeah, I was lifting something up and something just snapped in my abdomen and oh, was, this muscle is very sore on the left side, um, etc, etc. And then when you examine the patient, there's no fever, no raised pulse, no, no other signs of supporting signs of abdominal inflammation. And you say, based on the history, I think it's just a muscle spasm, you know, muscle relaxants. Please, if you develop nausea, vomiting, um, fevers, um, it might be that I've missed something like an appendicitis, and please come back or find or go to an emergency unit. Abdominal hematoma can also cause some muscle rigidity. I've never personally seen this myself, but I'm assuming it should be fairly easy to see that fluid filled sac on a sauna. And we've got all your functional conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome, which are due to complex interaction between your gut wall, your immune system, and your central nervous system. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, and then you've got your psychiatric conditions. Uh, depression often uh, presents as abdominal pain. In fact, depressed kids will sometimes um, present to you mainly complaining of abdominal pain rather than sadness. Even adult patients sometimes complain more of abdominal pain uh, than depression. Um, Anxiety attacks can uh, also cause abdominal pain. 
Um, and then you got your more sinister psychiatric conditions like the guy is deliberately pretending to be sick, the malingering patient, and the patient is just out for attention um, so he can manipulate people around him, the borderline personality um, type patient. These are my references. This particular article um, is quite excellent uh, if you want to need more detail. And this article has really nice flow diagrams that you can use uh, for the patient in, uh, with abdominal pain.